In this last unit, we're going to be talking about data augmentation. Let's suppose we want to build a sea otter detector. Here's a random set of sea otter images that I have retrieved from Google Image Search. As you can clearly see from this set of images, the uh, sea otters appear in very different poses. For instance, we have this guy here, which is somehow enjoying relaxing on his back. And then we have uh, the one lying here and uh, in all different kinds of poses, like a, a standing one here. In addition, um, these images appear in different color. And this is due to different lighting conditions or different cameras that have been used to take these photographs. Um, furthermore, also the appearance of the uh, otter changes because we are not always observing the same subject, right? So the pose, the appearance, the lighting, there's a lot of factors that contribute to the images looking very different. And that is what makes image recognition such a hard problem. Now, our object detector, our deep neural network that needs to recognize these images must be invariant to a wide variety of these input variations, right? We want this detector to be as invariant as possible to all of the intra-class variations that we're seeing here. We want all of these images to be correctly classified as sea otter. Now, the best way towards such generalization is to train with more data. However, data is typically limited in practice. And the reason for this is that, first of all, it's expensive to capture data, and then it's also expensive to annotate data. If we want to build a classifier, we need a data set that has images and label pairs. And so it's uh, both expensive to create and capture the data as well as to annotate the data. And in some cases, if you think about the medical domain, for instance, it's even very difficult to, to capture the data at all because there's just so few instances. Now, the goal of data augmentation is to take the original data set as is with its current size and from that data set to create new fake data on the fly. On the fly means during training, these are very simple transformations that we're adding. We can apply them very efficiently during training. We don't even need to store them. We can just apply them on the fly during training randomly. And then we are basically augmenting the data set with this. So we are, you can think about this as adding these additional new fake images to the training set. And here on the right, you can see some examples. We're gonna look at these uh, different transformations that have been used here in more detail. Now, what is important, of course, is that this new data must preserve the original semantics. If we transform the image such that the sea otter looks like a cat, then of course we don't want to include that image into the training set. So we must operate on a reasonable image manifold that doesn't change the semantics of the category that we want to classify in the case of image classification. And um, the amazing thing about data augmentation is that actually very simple operations, such as just applying slight translations or adding a little bit of pixel noise, um, often already lead to greatly improved generalization. You might think the image looks almost the same. It's just slightly translated. There's a slight blur or noise added, or the colors are slightly changed. But because the model has never seen these um, changes before, it's incredibly useful to the model to exploit them during training and to build a more robust model that way. There's also great libraries available to generate such augmented data and uh, I can recommend the library here behind that link, which is the library that I have used to generate the examples that you will see on the following slides. 
So let's go through a couple of these transformations and I have categorized them into different kinds of transformations. We're going to start with geometric transformations. So one very simple thing that you can do in order to create more data is to randomly crop your images. In this case here that you can see here, the images have been randomly cropped and then rescaled to the original image size such that all of the images in the data set have the same size. So this has some this operation has some parameter parameters that you can set such as like the region um, that you'd like to crop. It's not a good idea typically to crop very small regions because then the semantics is gone. You can't recognize the object anymore. But you can crop around a little bit around the object and you can still recognize the object. In this case, for instance, it's easy to recognize the object on all of the images, despite we have applied this cropping operation. In all slides that I show here at the bottom, I have illustrated the command that has been used um, using this library here that I have referenced here in order to generate these images. And I have generate, generated just random transformations using um, random crops in this case um, from exactly the same input image. Now, if you apply this to a whole data set, then of course you apply a random transformation with random parameters to each of the images. So you get all of the images you get augmented. You randomly draw an image or you'd randomly draw your mini batch and then you augment this image batch. Each element in this image batch, which is a different image, you augment differently using a random transformation. Here's another example. This is image cropping and padding. It's very simple, uh, very similar to the previous example, except that instead of the resizing, now we have a, uh, a padding operation where we, um, well, it's also resized here, but like if we crop it, then afterwards we, we pad the border with some either constant color um, or some, um, you know, some, some color that expands the color, that copies the color from the image borders or does something else to it, like decays it. What you can also do, and what is often done, is horizontal image fl flipping. If you look closely, there is some images here. This is completely randomly generated, so some of the images have not been flipped, some have been flipped. In this case, there is only two options, either the image is flipped or is not flipped. So you can see that some of these images here are flipped versions of the original input image. And in this case, we have chosen to flip the images with probability 0 0.5. As we will see later on, flipping is often a good idea, but sometimes it's not a good idea. So it really depends on the task um, that you tackle. For instance, if you want to do street scene semantic segmentation, it might be a good idea from the perspective of generating more data to actually flip the images horizontally. Um, because the images look very similar. Um, however, if, you if you're looking at scenes with right-handed traffic, right-sided traffic, then of course you obtain a different behavior if you flip the images. And that's a reason why you might not want to do that. So it really depends on the application. Also, what's less common is to flip the images upside down because often images are just captured um, in upright, orientation because this is how we as photographers uh, typically hold the camera and so this is not some invariance that we want to actually capture in our data set. This would actually make the recognition problem harder and we don't need to capture it because we rarely observe images that are completely um, flipped upside down. This is another popular augmentation strategy. It's a uh, a little bit more complex than just cropping. It applies an affine, a linear transformation to the 2D image space. And you can see that if uh, in the case that there is some regions um, that are not part of the original input image, you can either um, colorize them using a constant color or you can uh, um, copy the image into these regions as well. 
or extend the boundaries. So there's different strategies on how to fill these regions that are not present in the original image after applying this geometric transformation. You can also apply this piecewise. So in this case, there is a, it's a little underlying grid. And, and based on this, there is a, a piecewise affine transformation applied. You can see that different regions in these images are distorted differently. It's kind of a more local warping And uh, finally, here we have a perspective transformation. This is uh, similar to an affine transformation, just that it has a little bit more degrees of freedom. It's basically uh, doing a perspective transformation on the image plane. You can see that now um, the image uh, can, can uh, that, you, that we have this perspective effect appearing in these images where certain regions are squeezed and other regions are enlarged. Another type of transformation that you can apply your, to your original data set is to use local filters. So for instance, you can use Gaussian blur. Here is examples of different um, strength of Gaussian blur. In this case, for each image that I show here, the sigma value for the Gaussian blur kernel has been selected at random from the interval 0 to 10. You can see some of the images are more heavily blurred and some images are or remain sharper. And uh, this also makes your model more flexible because it, it tries to recognize objects at different um, resolutions effectively. And also when you're taking pictures with a camera, you typically have a little bit of, of blur applied through the process of actually taking of, of capturing the light in uh, your lens and on your imager. And so um, adding a little bit of Gaussian blur is often something that is helpful. You can also do the opposite. You can also try to sharpen your images. And here's uh, examples of sharpened sea otters at uh, different uh, levels of uh, sharpness, I can see. Um, this is another effect, it's called emboss effect. Maybe you have seen that before in your image manipulation tool. It's another effect that you can just apply to your images. You can see how this affects your generalization performance. Here in this case, we have combined the original image with an edge detected version of it. So the image looks very different. And now we can see that maybe we have left a little bit the interval of reasonable values for this operation as in some of these cases, like in this one here on the top right, it's actually quite hard to recognize the sea otter. Another important thing to consider is just per pixel noise or more structured noise to be added to the input images. And this is a very, very general and popular data augmentation technique, it's maybe the, the first thing that you would do in order to start with data augmentation is to add random noise to your images. Oh, why is this important? Well, deep neural networks are actually quite sensitive to noise. If you add some noise to your images, um, the it's very likely, so if you add your noise to the test images only, it's very likely that the performance will drop dramatically. So here's an example from um, Matthias Bethke and Felix Wichmann's group um, where we compared the performance of deep neural networks recognizing images against humans. And so they, they looked at simple examples. In this case here, um, the deep neural network was trained on um, the original image and tested on the same distribution. And the uh, deep neural network was able to um, show superhuman performance. In the second case, there was noise added to um, both the training and the test images, and it was the same level of noise. It was a, a kind of additive uniform noise that was added here, but the train and the test distribution were the same. And again, the deep, deep model showed superhuman performance. Now in this last experiment here, what they did is they added a um, salt and pepper noise to the training images. So 
with some probability the training uh, a pixel in the training image was set to either black or white and uh, for the test set we also added noise but this time they added um, uh, the uh, um, the uniform noise from before the additive uniform noise and in this case despite the fact that as humans both images look noisy and the noise distribution doesn't look that different the test performance dropped nearly to chance level so the model didn't learn or the model didn't perform well at all on this test set and this shows how um, susceptible these deep neural networks are to um, noise in the inputs and also of course if we take images our cameras um, they produce noise depending on the illumination conditions and on the sensor that we're using so noise is really everywhere in images and so it's important to consider so if we want to add noise as a data augmentation strategy the simplest thing that we can do is we can add Gaussian noise to each pixel um, separately so this is a per pixel independent transformation that we're applying and for all of the images that I show here we have applied for each image to all pixels the same noise but we have varied the level of noise across the different images and this is an example with salt and pepper noise where with some probability each pixel has been turned um, either black or white and here's another example it's called dropout noise in this case uh, the pixels have been with some probability dropped out to black in this case and uh, here in this example the dropout probability has been varied between 0 0.01 and 0 0.5 you can see different rates of dropout here and we can also apply more structured noise we can cover entire regions within the input image also as a data augmentation strategy and this is called cutout you can see some examples here you can not only apply noise to the inputs of the neural network which are here at the bottom but you can also apply the noise throughout the neural network and a very prominent example is the one that we have just learned about which is called dropout where we with some probability um, drop out certain neurons in a neural network but of course instead of doing dropout we could also imagine adding just noise to these individual units and the advantage of doing that is that now we apply this we, we add this robustness not only to at the input le feature level but also at intermediate levels where higher level concepts um, higher level representations inside the neural network are established so it's something that often also works quite well The next transformations I want to talk about are color transformations. This is something that is also extremely useful and uh, it has been key to the success of many neural networks that work well on the ImageNet dataset. The reason why color transformations are important is that um, cameras um, produce a different color spectrum depending on the type of sensors, depending on the type of or depending on the white balancing that has been performed. And also the lighting condition can be very different. It can be sunset with warmer colors or it can be um, midnight or midday. Um, and so the colors can change dramatically for the same scene that conveys the same semantics, that shows the same object. So color transformations are, are really, really key for many data sets. So here is a very simple transformation you can do you can simply change the contrast of the images you can see that some of these images now are more faint and some of them are more have a stronger contrast again the contrast manipulation or the contrast strength has been chosen randomly for each image here but this is just a 
a distribution that you specify as a param parameter to this library that then generates these augmented images. You can do the same, of course, for the brightness. So we have some darker images and some brighter images here. And you can do that per channel. So now the images look more funky. So you have um, different colorized version, versions of each other. Right? So I've always exaggerated the results here a little bit. Maybe you don't want to apply these transformations as strongly as I show it here, but just to highlight the differences. You can also change the brightness locally. In this case, again, we have done it per channel so that the colors um, look also different. But you can see, for instance, if we look at this image here, that now these transformations have been applied locally um, based on some frequency noise that we have added. So we have we are, have some regions here that look different than other regions. So it's not a, a non it's not a per pixel transformation anymore that we apply here. And we can, of course, also change hue and saturation of the images. You can see that in some cases here, saturation has been decreased. And in, in some cases, we have more colorful images with a different hue value. We can also simply invert colors. For this makes the images look, look very different from images that we would actually observe in the real world. However, it can still be a very useful and impactful learning um, data set for your deep neural network. So it's really an empirical choice that you have to empirically investigate which is the best data strategy for data augmentation strategy for your problem. Of course, you can also um, convert your color images into grayscale or um, look at a um, images that are somewhere in between grayscale and full color images. And you can also add more sophisticated effects. For instance, if you have a sophisticated graphic simulation engine, you can add these weather effects. Um, in this case, these are very simple effects, so they don't require a sophisticated graphics engine. They can be generated very efficiently, so you don't need to pre-compute those. You can also calculate those on the fly. In this case, this is an effect called snow. I'm not sure how much it looks like snow, but it's more white <laughs> now. And then this is an effect that's called clouds. So it produces some cloud distortions on top of the original images. And this is a effect called fog, also from this library that I showed in the beginning. Good. Now, what I've showed so far are transformations, in this case, 12 different transformations of exactly the same input image. But of course, you want to apply this to the entire data set and ideally on the fly so that you don't even need to store these intermediate data sets, this augmented data set, but you can generate it on the fly. And so you end up with random transformations of all kinds of objects in the end of, of different objects um, and randomly combine these effects. In this case, it's still an example for a single input image but you apply these random combinations of effects on a random set of images. Right? So you draw in your mini batch, you draw a random element, and then you apply a random transformation from this generative process of transformations that you have defined. Right? And this is what is shown here. This is a random combination of effects applied to the same input image. Yeah. Um, in some cases, it's important to also transform the output, not only the input. Um, but you need to be careful for some tasks. So for instance, um, in, uh, in the classification task where you don't need to transform the output typically, it can happen that you're changing the semantics. Uh, so consider, for instance, the handwritten letter recognition task, where you want to recognize we build a deep model that recognizes handwritten letters. Um, you need to be careful to not apply transformations that would change the output class. So here's an example. If we, for instance, consider this um, letter D, this hand-drawn letter D, and we would apply horizontal flips, the letter D would be converted, the input would be converted such that it would look like a different letter, the letter B, right? 
But if we don't also flip the label, then, and this is typically not what we do during classification, then we just want to exclude this type of transformation from the augmentation strategy to not have this um, semantic changes in our um, data set, right? Because if we would not change also the label, then we would now have a letter B that would have the letter D and that would confuse the classifier. Here's another example. This is a digit six that is rotated by 180 degrees and turns into the digit nine. So having a 180 degree rotation on MNIST is not what you want to do for um, as a data augmentation strategy. But as a remark, um, for general object recognition, if you want to recognize, for instance, sea otters, then these flips and also some level of rotation can often be quite useful. So it really depends on the task that you're interested in, what type of transformations you want to apply. In some tasks, when we think about tasks that are not just recognition, not just classification, where the output space is more complex, we might also need to transform the targets, the outputs, the ground truth outputs. So here we have examples with um, depth prediction, semantic instance mask prediction, key point prediction, and a bounding box detection. All of these are structured outputs. And of course, if we now translate the object or we um, apply some, some other geometric transformation to the input, then we also need to transform the target correspondingly. We also need to translate the instant mask, for instance. If we just apply a per pixel transformation, like a, a color change or some noise, then the output or the target stays valid, so we don't need to transform. In some cases, like in the case of depth prediction or stereo prediction, it's even more difficult because we can't just um, translate one image without translating the other and um, changing the actual depth values. So it really depends on the output that you are predicting, which input transformations you want to apply, and if and how you need to also transform the targets in order to create a valid data set. Some final remarks on data augmentation. When comparing two networks, let's say you compare your model to the state-of-the-art model that you have re-implemented or you downloaded the code somewhere and you run it on your computer, you need to make sure that you use exactly the same augmentation strategy. Because augmentation is so powerful, it can increase performance dramatically. If you don't do that, then you might be misled and um, it might appear to you that maybe your model innovations are actually giving you the benefit while actually it's just the data augmentation strategy that is different. Um, it's also good to consider data augmentation as part of your network design. As I mentioned before, ideally you do this simple transformations that are fast to compute on the fly so that you don't need to transfer a lot of memory. You can do this very efficiently on the GPU. It's also important to specify the right uh, distributions, the right distributions over this transformation space, which unfortunately there is no um, golden rule for this. It's often done empirically via trial and error, but it's important to think about these distributions and what transformations are valid and what transformations are not valid and then design these, specify these random ranges from where to crop, etc., cetera, um, based on this intuition and some um, trial and error experiments. The idea of data augmentation can also be combined with the ensemble idea. For instance, very well-performing models on ImageNet often sample random crops and scales at training time and then train one model or even multiple models, and then at inference time, average the predictions for a fixed set of crops of the test image. So even, even if you have trained only a single model, you can apply that single model to different crops of the test image as well. And then you can take this ensemble prediction as a more robust and more powerful predictor um, that gives you slightly better performance. So the data augmentation strategy and the ensemble ideas can be combined. 
And then finally, there's also some work and I've referenced a specific paper here at the bottom that um, tries to go towards finding these data augmentation strategies in a more principled manner automatically using reinforcement learning um, from uh, data. You can see here at the bottom that uh, there is a, a policy that has um, basically uh, been split into sub policies and then um, when we apply data augmentation in this case, we can choose randomly from the sub policies which have been automatically determined by the algorithm to lead to a good generalization performance on the data set of interest. That's all for today.